sometimes statement may not be clear. But there is always a deeper understanding. It is not just about the who said what. The whens, hows and whers are equally important. Join me on a whole new journey in the conversation with Augustus as I bring you discussions from religion to politics. Health to economy. Humanity to social activities among many others. Conversation with Augustus knows no foreign borders. The show comes to you every Wednesday at 6.15 p.m. GMT on our YouTube channel Conversation with Augustus and on Radio Angelus www.radioangelus.com This program is sponsored by Safe Life Experience Concert Limited. Contact them for all your travel and tour needs, as well as your events. with Augustus and today we are talking about how to study the Bible. But before I delve into that topic, kindly please subscribe to this channel and click on the button beside the subscribe button so that whenever we post new videos you can have access to it. Conversation with Augustus comes to you this and every Wednesday at 6 15 pm on Radio Angels www.radioangels.com and also on our YouTube channel conversation with Augustus. So the Bible is the manual for Christians. This is the constitution. But how do we study it? In Ghana, we have the 92 constitution, which is the law for the country, used in governing the country. So as Christians, the Bible becomes a constitution. And that's what we are talking about, how to study the Bible. And my guest is Reverend Father Michael Dr. Mesa, who studied at the Gregorian University in Rome, and now it's at the University of Ghana. Father Mike, you are most welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, Father, uh, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing very well, thank you. So, um, it's interesting, looking at your title, Reverend Father Dr. Michael Mason, it, it, it sounds so beautiful. I wish I could have that VR in my name one day. Um, uh, well, thank you very much, August, uh, Augustus. I, no, nobody knows the trouble that comes with that VR. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Very true. Today we are talking about the Bible and um, how do we study the Bible. First of all, Father, can you tell us what is the Bible? Well, okay, thank you, Augustus. Um, so let's begin maybe just by talking about what the word Bible, um, where it comes from. So uh, actually the word Bible, okay, comes from a plural um, Greek word. So ta biblia, so biblia is a plural word from the word biblion, which means a book. So Biblia is the plural meaning books. So what books are, um, are we talking about? Uh, here is the idea that the Bible is actually, if you like, a compendium of books. And that is why when you take your Bible, you open the Old Testament, you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or if you took, for instance, your New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so on and so forth. So uh, from the etymology, we understand that the Bible is a library. 
if you like, or a compendium of books. But having said that, maybe from a more technical point of view, we know that the Bible contains the written word of God. So this is a book that contains the word of God that has been set down in writing. Um, so that is what the Bible is. Now, like I mentioned earlier, therefore the Bible is divided into two main sections. And that is the Old Testament, uh, which contains... 46 books for us Catholics, that is if you add the deuterocanonical books, that's seven books, um, the Protestants have 39 books, and then in the New Testament we all have 27 books, so that is what the Bible is. Um, for us, especially as Catholics, we have 70, 73 books in the Bible, so that is what the Bible is, um, the written word of God. Okay, so it is basically the written word of God. Um, I would, I think maybe one day would have to talk about um, why is that Catholics have extra um, books in addition to um, the sixty-six books. If you, if you, if you would touch a little bit on it before we, maybe so that one day we we'll just um, dive into it um, deeper. Why is that Catholics um, have extra um, books in addition to the sixty-six? So Catholics have seventy-two books. All right, thank you very much, Augustine. Maybe just very quickly, uh, so here we are talking about books like um, First and Second Maccabees. We are talking about Tobit and Judith. We're talking about books like Baruch, Sirach, or otherwise called Ecclesiasticals. We're talking about uh, parts of Esther and Daniel, the Book of Wisdom, and so on and so forth. So these are the books that we are referring to as the deuterocanonical books. These are books that if you took a Catholic Bible, you would find. And if you took a regular Protestant Bible, you would not find out why these extra books that are found in the Catholic um, Bible. This is because um, the Catholic Bible, the books in the Catholic Bible, were taken from what we call the Greek canon or the Alexandrian canon. We have to remember that the Old Testament it was written principally in Hebrew, but later on, about 285 years before Jesus was born, these books were translated into Greek. And why were they translated into Greek? Because everybody who was living outside Jerusalem in places like where Paul preached in Corinth, in, Eph in Ephesus, in Colossae, in, in Philippi, all these um, early Jewish Christians would have been reading their Bible in Greek. And so um, the Greek canon had all these extra books. In fact, it even had other books which today are not in the Catholic canon. Now, the reason is that Christians were majority were Hellen Hellenistic or if you like Greek Christians. They were living in Greek speaking areas. So they, they took their books from the Greek translated books. And these Greek books contained many other of these books that um, did not end up in the Hebrew canon. Okay, and that is why, um, because we come from the tradition of Greek Christians, that's the reason why most in our New Testament you have, in fact, our whole New Testament is written in Greek, that's the first evidence. Then you talk about all our first Corinthians, you know, the letter to the Galatians, all these were Greek Christian communities. So it isn't surprising that our um, Old Testament reflects a Greek Christian tradition. And, and that is why we have these um, other books which were read by the Greek Christians. And, and, and that is how come, or I should say the Greek Jew, Jews and Christians, and that is how come we find these books in our canon. Thank you so much, Father. The program is Conversation with Augustus, and this program comes to you this and every Wednesday at 6.15 p.m. on our YouTube channel, Conversation with Augustus, and also on Radio Angelus, www.radioangelus.com. We are talking about how to study the Bible, and Father has already um, told us what the Bible is, and why is that Catholics have 72 books, and the Protestants have 66 books. Yes, just um, touched on that. At a later day, we would dive into it deeper. So, Father, why is it that the Bible is so important for Christians? 
Well, um, so if I just said that this, the Bible uh, contains the written word of God, you remember what Jesus said, um, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the, the word of God is so fundamental, it is so important in the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, because this is God speaking to us. And remember that God revealed himself to Israel principally through his word. And um, for us as Christians, we also have to remember, for instance, in John's gospel, in the prologue of John, John chapter 1 verse 14, that we are told the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the revelation of God to us came through the word. Jesus Christ himself was the word that became flesh. So it's fundamental that we cannot do without the word of God. The word of God is so central to the revelation of God. If we want to know who God is, we simply have to engage with his word. And that is why the church father, St. Jerome, uh, famously said, um, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Ignorance of the scripture is ignorance of Christ. Um, so before studying the Bible, what must one take into consideration? I want to study the Bible. Can I just wake up and then look at the Bible and then I'm doing it? So what, what, what are some of the things that one should um, consider before picking the Bible, first of all, to um, study it? All right. So I'm going to just outline four things that I think that everyone should consider carefully. Uh, when you're going to study um, the Word of God or the Bible. So the first thing um, I would like you to remember is that the Bible is um, written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it is more or less a divine, divinely authored book. And that means that we cannot engage with the Bible if we don't remember that the person the author, you know, behind the Bible is the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that inspired men to write down all that and only that which he wanted them to write. So uh, first and foremost, let's remember that before you engage the Bible, remember that you're reading the word of God. This is a divinely inspired word. And that's why we must always engage the Bible with an atmosphere of deep reflection and prayer and asking God, you know, to open to us the meaning of his word. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing that you want to consider before you study the Bible is to remember that even though the Holy Spirit inspired human beings um, to write uh, this, uh, this word, human beings use their own faculty, their own understanding, their own words, their own language, you know, to their, they were influenced by their own culture to write what they wrote. So um, if you're reading Matthew, remember that Matthew was a Jew living in Palestine, you know, 2000 years ago. The language he used was the language of his day. And when he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, he's, he's saying that because that is, that is the language he uses, Aramaic, you know, he's speaking his language uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he, they're using the metaphors, you know, they're using the kind of understanding of their day. For instance, when uh, the Jew says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Uh, for a Jew, uh, the heart is not uh, the, the seat of how, just how you feel. Maybe, you know, love the Lord with your heart or your feeling. No, the heart is what you think with. So he said, when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, he's saying, love the, the Lord your God with how you think, with your mind, you know. So you have to understand that he's using his human expression, his human language. And that is why before we study the Bible, remember that even though this Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's also, um, it's also using human language. And therefore, we need to understand who the author is. Where does he come from? What circumstance, what historical circumstance was he living under? and so on and so forth. So remember that you need to understand the human author. Paul is very, very different from Jonah. Isaiah is very, very different from Mark. You know, uh, these are two completely different people. Um, 
uh, the author of the book of Genesis is quite different from the author of the book of Revelation. They, they are living on completely different times, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, if an American is writing, it's very different from what a Ghanaian is writing. Uh, even the kind of food he talks about is different, you know. So that is the kind of thing that we need to take note of. I knew somebody was writing in 1950s. In the 1950s, is different from somebody who was writing in the year 2020. Somebody in the 1950s will never write about WhatsApp. Somebody in 2020 will write about <laughs> WhatsApp. Of course. In the 19, in the 1980s, will not write about Corona. Uh, somebody in 2020 writes about Corona. So, if people are living 40 years apart, how they write what they understand. Yesterday, if you said social distancing, nobody will understand you. Today, if you say social distancing, we all know what it means. So depending on when the person lived, how he writes, what he's writing about, you know, means so many different things. And that's why we need to take account of the historical circumstance in which the person was writing. Now, the third thing we need to take into consideration before we study the Bible is to understand that the Bible uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, is more like a compendium of books. It's not just one book. It's a several books, a library of books put together. And um, one book influences our understanding of another book. So we don't take a particular text and a particular passage and take it out of context. When we are reading a particular passage, we read it in the light of what we know from the other books. So for instance, we read in, um, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, 16 and following, we read how Jesus went to Nazareth, to the town that he came from. And when he got there, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring, you know, liberty to the captives and so on, recovery of sight to the blind, to, to, to declare a year of favor from the Lord. But when we read that passage from Luke's Gospel, we have to be always conscious that the same passage, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, is actually found in Isaiah chapter 61. So you can't read Luke chapter 4 without being conscious of Isaiah chapter 61. And then, for instance, when you're reading that Jesus went to Nazareth and he declared a year of favor from the Lord, you can't divorce that from Leviticus chapter 25 because it's in Leviticus chapter 25 that you actually understand what a year of favor means. That's the Jubilee year. And if you read actually from Leviticus 25, 8, you understand that in the Jubilee year, everybody was supposed to go to their hometown. That is why Jesus went to Nazareth in the first place. So um, you cannot understand one aspect of the Bible if you don't take into consideration another aspect, another part of the Bible. So we don't read, we don't read the Bible, biblical text out of context. We take into consideration everything, the whole Bible. And that is why it is not advisable just to read one passage in isolation, but read the Bible with a broad understanding of the whole. Finally, anytime you read the Bible, don't forget that you are not the first person who read it. This Bible has been read over a course of 2,000 years. Um, St. Um, Augustine read it before you read it. Uh, St. Jerome read it before you read it. Um, down the ages, the saints have read it in Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of, 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 of Lisieux, St. Teresa of Calcutta, all the popes have read it. And therefore, as you're reading it, you also take into consideration the fact that you're not the first person. What have other people said about it? What has the church always read about it? Uh, and you need to take into consideration all these things because you are part of the community of believers. And therefore, what the other believers have read and, and said about it must also influence your understanding of the text. No one is an island. We read as a community. Thank you so much, um, Father. That, that's a very deeper explanation on the four um, things to consider before um, reading the Bible. But um, when, you were, when you were explaining this, something came to mind. Is this um, the reason why we have... Uh, this uh, misinterpretation when it comes to um, reading the Bible. Because sometimes you may realize that, um, as you said, uh, let me use um, Matthew and then Isaiah, um, Luke and Isaiah, for example, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's, it's also found in um, Isaiah. 
there was a time I was reading the Bible when I came across these two things. I was asking myself, so it, it, does it mean that Isaiah is Jesus? That was a wow. question I, 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 I started asking on the mountain. Moses and then uh, Elijah came okay. to him, one to empower him with uh, the prophecy, and then Moses with the law. So at the end of the day, I was asking myself, was Isaiah? Because when you read Isaiah and then we read the life of Jesus in the New Testament, the New Testament, the gospel, it's like this man was prophesied. Doesn't mean that he was the one who came. So there, there was a bit of confusion in my mind. And a lot of people read the Bible and may take it just like that. And we have it. so is it the reason why we, we normally have this misconception um, uh, confusion in our in our mind or something may Turn up to misinterpret the the Bible. Well, well, yes, um, Augustus. I guess you're right, and th this is why uh, these four parameters are quite important, you know, for us to read the Bible, because otherwise uh, we can easily land in misinterpretation, you know, of Scripture. So let me go back to your question. For instance, what it means that Jesus was saying that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, not necessarily. He wasn't necessarily there for Isaiah. But clearly what the passage is saying is that he definitely had the spirit of prophecy. And what is the meaning of prophecy? It means that he was speaking in the place of God. In fact, that is why when he opened the scroll, he said that, you know, this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Okay, so he was also a prophet, if you like. And you know that Isaiah was one of the foremost prophets in the Bible. So he's also a prophet like Isaiah. Now, why, why was that fundamental? Why was that important? You remember that immediately after that, the people started saying, ah, is that not the son of Joseph? You know? Yeah. And, 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 and why, why is that significant? Why is that significant? Because, you know, the, the people, according to them, look, if you are a carpenter's son, you, you become a carpenter. That is, that is what they call wisdom. Wisdom means the skill that you acquire. Okay, so you acquire that wisdom from your father. If your father is a doctor, you are also a doctor. If your father is a farmer, you are also a farmer. If your father is a carpenter, you're also a carpenter. And then they were asking, so where did he get this from? Okay, because he, was do he wasn't doing carpentry. He was explaining scripture. So where did, he where did he get this from? And then Jesus is explaining that it's true. I'm not behaving like my father who is a carpenter because... I have this knowledge, I have this wisdom, not from a human source, but from a divine source. And you know, it is the prophets who had this inspiration from the divine source. If you remember again in the book of Amos, this is exactly the same thing that happens between Amos and Amaziah, the priest. When he goes to prophesy in the, in the northern, in, in the sanctuary in Israel, Amaziah says, look, go back to this Judah and, and prophesy. Why are you coming to prophesy here? He says, look, I was, I was a, a farmer. You know, I, I used to tend, you know, sycamore trees. But the Lord called me, you know, and he sent me to come and prophesy. So the reason why Jesus is prophesying is not because he's learned it from his father, who is a carpenter. It is because he has received the spirit and the commission, the prophetic spirit, like Amos, like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, and so on and so forth. And that is why he has begun to prophesy. So that is the reason, uh, and that's the meaning of the passage. And again, like I said, we can only understand this if we read um, Luke chapter 4, 16 and following in concept, you know, um, against the background of what we know from other passages of scripture. Thank you so much, Father Michael, um, for that um, explanation. The program is The Conversation with Augustus, and today we are talking about how to study the Bible. We are also live on Radio Angelus, www.radioangelus.com. So, Father, my next question to you, how do we study the Bible? Is there any appropriate way uh, to study in the Bible? All right, so there are really many, many, many approaches uh, to study the Bible. Um, several approaches exist, and uh, but maybe there is one very, very simple way, you know, um, which um, again and again has been mentioned in many church documents. And I will call that simply um, the Lexio Divina approach, which is structured in four, four uh, parts. 
So there is what we call the Lectio or the reading of the scripture. Then there is the Meditatio, that is to meditate on the scripture. Um, there is the Contemplatio, which is to contemplate what the scripture is talking about. And then there is the Oratio, and that is prayer. So four things. First and foremost, you read the scripture, then you meditate upon it, then you contemplate on it, and then finally you pray with it. So those are the four main ways. Now, when we talk about Lectio, what goes into it? Lectio is practically an attentive reading of the scripture. And you may want to do it in two ways. First and foremost, to read it aloud, so you can read it aloud. And sometimes um, it's interesting, even for, 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 for me as a priest, sometimes um, I have studied the scripture, even prepared, you know, for mass and so on and so forth. But when I, when I sit and somebody is, the lector is reading it, I sometimes hear things I never heard when I was reading it silently on my own. And that's very, very interesting. So these two aspects of reading, the, the silent reading and the reading aloud, you know, are very important. So maybe first and foremost, read it aloud and then read it silently. So that is the first step uh, of reading, of, of studying. First, lectio, read it. Now, lectio also means that um, you pay close attention to what you are reading because very often um, we have certain storylines already in our head which are actually not in the text itself. You know, so when you're reading it, um, you, you, you are actually reading, you, you're thinking you are seeing what is in the text, but actually that is not there, you know, so you're reading things in your mind that is not in the text. So lectio means, another thing that it means is a close reading, a very attentive reading. You are taking, you know, cognizance of what words are there, even how many times those words are repeated in the text. Um, you're, you are taking cognizance of the arrangement of the words. You're paying close, 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 close attention. You know, so um, that is what the Lexio is about, a very close and attentive reading of the scripture. And I can assure you that when you do a, a good Lexio, you almost always will come up with things that you didn't even realize were in the text. Okay, so that's the first thing, close reading. Now, um, after, let me add even one thing, even, even in the lexio, even in the reading, sometimes you even want to read for more than one version. So you can even take maybe reading the RSV, then after that you take the good news, and then after that you take the, um, the New American Bible, and so on and so forth. And this works very well, especially if you're studying together with other people in a group. So one person reads it from this version, that person reads it from that version. That's all part of your lexio. All it's seeking to do is that you are paying close attention to the text. Now, the second thing that um, you can then do is what we call the meditatio. So after reading it, uh, the meditatio means you're thinking about this text. So you're thinking about it. Um, very, very carefully, you are considering everything. Sometimes you're, what are you considering? You're considering, for instance, who are the people who are mentioned in this text? You're reading the story of Zac um, Zacchaeus. Who, who are the people mentioned? Jesus, Zacchaeus, the crowds, you know, um, you, you're talking about the place where the thing is happening. Uh, the time of the day when the thing is happening. So you're, you're taking all these things into consideration. Now, it is also in this meditatio that you are trying to connect it with, for instance, with other passages of scripture. So like I mentioned, you're reading from Luke chapter four, you're trying to connect it with other passages of scripture. Now, that is why in studying the Bible, in doing your meditatio, um, you you actually need a good Bible, a good Bible, let's say like the, um, the new Jerusalem Bible. Why, why, why am I talking about the good? You need a good study Bible because usually in a study Bible, what you see is that apart from just the plain text, you find these 
little annotation sometimes in the margins or sometimes certain certain footnotes. And what they do is that they lead you to other connected passages of scripture, that are what we call parallel passages. You know, so you're connecting your passage with other passages to see what other passages are saying about that same text of scripture. All this you're doing in your meditatio, you're connecting it, you know, you're asking questions um, and so on and so forth. So this is what uh, you are, you're doing in, in a meditatio. You're trying to really understand. So meditatio is really about thinking. You need to think about the passage, ask your questions. What is this? Again, like I said, if you're doing it in a group study, this is where somebody asks one question, another person tries to respond. You know, you are thinking about the text. You are thinking about the text. You can do it also silently, you know, thinking, trying to understand what are the words that are used, you know, who are the people that are mentioned, what is the place, why is he saying this, why is he doing that, and so on and so forth. So that is what you're doing in the meditatio stage. Now, let me add, and I, I'm sure we'll go to that, that you sometimes you want to use certain um, tools, for instance, to enrich your meditatio. And that is where, for instance, if you, there's a word that is not clear, you can consult, for instance, a Bible dictionary. What's the meaning of this word? You know, what is the deeper meaning? Where is it used in the Bible? Uh, what are the other places where it's used? or even a name of a town. Where, where is this town? You can actually even look sometimes in your Bible, you have a map. Jesus is going from uh, you know, um, Jerusalem to Jericho. A man is going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Where is Jerusalem? Where is Jericho? You know, and so on and so forth. You, you are able to trace that on the map. All this is going to enrich your meditatio. Meditatio is supposed to help you to understand what you're reading. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch and uh, saying, how can I understand unless somebody leads me? So you're going to understand the text. Then the third thing you're doing is your contemplatio. Now, contemplatio practically means that and this is where you're asking God to speak to you. So studying the Bible cannot just be an academic thing. It's also an engagement. You know, like I said, it's the, it's the divinely inspired word of God. And therefore, contemplation means you allow the light of the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And this is where, uh, in studying the Bible, you allow God to, to, uh, to speak to you in your peculiar situation. In your contemplatio, sometimes you want to even enter into the Word of God. You want to be Zacchaeus. You want to see what is happening, what Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus. Um, you want to enter into the text like the blind man who was at the beautiful gate, or the lame man, sorry, who was at the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John came by, silver and gold uh, have I none, but what I have, I do give. You want to enter into how he felt when, when, when Peter and John said to him, rise up and walk, you know, so you allow God to speak to you at the point of your need. So you make this a personal thing. It's not only an academic thing, who is saying what and so on and so forth, but you make it a personal thing. And finally, oratio means that you don't leave without praying. Um, engaging the word of God must lead us to pray. It must lead us either to ask for something from God or to, um, to adore him or to thank him for what he's done or to ask for forgiveness for something that we have done or even ask for something that we might need, maybe not for ourselves, but even for another person who has asked you to pray for them. So uh, these are the four things, the four stages that I want you to, to go through when you're doing your study of scripture. Remember to read the Bible, read it silently and aloud. Remember to think about it, think about it rigorously, ask questions of the text. Remember to allow God you know, to engage you, to speak to you, to lead you into the text, to feel his presence whatever he's saying to you. And finally, pray, pray, intercede, pray for yourself, pray for somebody, ask for forgiveness, give him thanks for what he's revealed to you. Thank you so much, Father. But um, as you already mentioned, I was going to go there anyway. Um, the tools that we that we need to use in um, reading the Bible, what's a, what are some of the tools that we need? It's all right. So um, I'm going to talk about mainly... Um, Again, about four tools that you need. So um, the first thing that you need 
<laughs> you can't do without. It's the Bible. You need the text. <laughs> and uh, when, when I talk about uh, the text, I mean that you need a good Bible. You know, I, I just mentioned a while ago that it's good to have a study Bible. So a study Bible is not a pocket Bible, but it's a study Bible, one that has footnotes, one that has references, and so on and so forth. So you need a text. You need a good text. Um, now, what text is good? People keep asking me, Father, what Bible should I buy? Um, so you need a good text, like I said, one that has study notes. So the Jerusalem, New Jerusalem Bible is a fantastic one. Um, I love the RSV. I love the RSV because the RSV, you know, uh, has a text which is closest to the text in Hebrew and in Greek. So I love the RSV for that for that reason. Sometimes you may want to have more than one Bible. So you need a good Bible that you can rely on. Now, um, the second thing that you need are uh, um, other reference, let's say uh, reference material. Now, what reference material am I talking about? I already mentioned a Bible dictionary. The Bible dictionary would explain certain, you know, maybe a word that you, you, you don't understand, a place that you want to understand. A Bible dictionary will clarify these things for you. Where is Jericho? You know, what, what, what do we know about Jericho? What do we know about Tiberias? What do we know about the Sea of Galilee? All these things, a good Bible dictionary, which you can find in any Catholic bookshop, will be able to explain these things to you. You need a concordance. A concordance is a, a, a book that um, it can help you to trace where every particular word in scripture is found. It's a beautiful book. So for instance, let's say that you, 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 you find the word covenant, and then you want to know where covenant is found in the Bible. It is found maybe 300 times in the Bible. Where is it found? You need a concordance. A concordance will lead you to find where the word covenant is used everywhere in the Bible. That's where. You want to find where Peter is mentioned everywhere in the Bible, look at it, look for the concordance. The concordance will tell you that. Um, you need a lexicon. Sometimes you need a lexicon, especially if you are reading or you're studying the Bible, maybe even in the original text in Hebrew and in Greek, a lexicon will give you, for instance, say the, the, the word agape. What is the meaning of the word agape, the Greek word agape? You hear sometimes people talk about agape. What does it mean? Okay, that's a lexicon will tell you the precise meaning of agape. So that's what a lexicon does. Then sometimes you need even a Bible atlas. So you, you want to understand where is Egypt? Where is the Mediterranean Sea? Uh, where is Nineveh? Okay, Nineveh is actually in modern day Iraq. It's close to the city called Mosul, where um, the Islamic State had their headquarters. So you, you might be surprised to find this. Okay, um, um, so these are, these are where, where, is, where is Antioch? Where is Tarsus? Paul came from Tarsus. Where is Tarsus today? Tarsus is in modern day Turkey. So is Ephesus. Ephesus in Turkey. Corinth is in Greece, you know, and so on and so forth. You need to find these things on the map. You need a good Bible atlas. So these are some of the tools that you need. In addition to that, sometimes you need um, scholarly material, good um, commentary. Yeah, these are very good commentaries all around a good Bible commentary, uh, the New Jerome Biblical commentary to, to be able to explain certain things you don't understand to you. And other books, monographs, you know, books that have been written by scholars to explain certain aspects of scripture. You need all these kinds of material, study material. These are the tools that you need when you're studying the scripture. Thank you so much, um, Father Michael Mesa, for um, that explanation, the tools that we need um, just before we start studying the Bible. So having given us the tools that we need, then my next question is, how do we start? Well, okay, so how do we start studying the Bible? Um, these days, sometimes if you go into the bookshop, sometimes they have what they call reading plans or study plans. So there's some books that you can find, you know, that help you um, to give you a study plan. Um, otherwise, for instance, we in the Catholic tradition, we have the beauty of having um, the Sunday readings or the daily readings, you know, 
Um, so you can, we can do it in a liturgical way. The, the great thing about that is that if you're studying using the text, the, the text for mass, you are liturgically conscious because in Lent, the kind of passages you'll be studying, for instance, will, will lead you into the spirit of Lent. In Easter, you have passages that lead you into the spirit of Easter. In Pentecost, you have passages that lead into the... So you can, we can do it in a liturgical way follow the liturgical season. We are studying passages according to what liturgical season we are in, either the Sunday readings or the daily readings. That's a way of doing it. Now, there are other ways of, of studying. Where do you start from? Now, one of the ways I remember long ago, my teacher uh, of scripture uh, introduced me to, he said, if you want to study the Bible, why don't you start from the shortest book? So, you know, if you start from from uh, first corinthians oh my goodness if you're not careful you may give up on the way because it's a long book about 15 if you start from isaiah which has 66 chapters oh the likelihood is that you you stop you know halfway <laughs> so so practical way of doing it is by studying starting from uh the, the the smaller books look the letter of philemon is only one chapter so why don't you start from philemon you know um it's, it's such a small book of the book of Jude. You know, it's one chapter. So why don't you start from the shorter books? So that's one way. Um, the, the letters to Timothy, for instance, are not longer than four chapters they're about. So um, why don't you start from, from those, those shorter, shorter books? Three chapters, you are done. So that's one way, you know, of studying it. Start from a shorter book. Another way of doing it is starting, for instance, from... Um, let's say the Gospels. Why? Because you're already quite familiar with the Gospels. You already know the storylines of uh, biblical books like the Gospel of Mark, you know, Gospel according to Mark. Uh, it is quite short um, and, and therefore you can finish it quite soon. So that is another way of starting. So you could either use the study plans, like I said, you could um, maybe find a book in, in the, in the, in the in the bookshop that leads you to a study plan where you can study or you can do it also with um with the liturgical books and the schedule readings or you could just start for instance with a short book in the scripture start from there and that would be a good way another way that i think that is important is sometimes don't do it all alone because if you do it all alone it is very easy that along the way you can fall apart so why don't you start with a friend okay let's say Augustus and I, look, we're going to start studying together the book of, let's say, Acts of the Apostles. Okay, so uh, we do it together so that when every day when we've read our passage of scripture, what do we do? We, we compare notes. What did you see about it? How did you, how did you understand it? So that's a nice way, you know, of, of, of sharing and, 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 grow, and growing. Or we can even establish, if you like, a Bible study group. Okay. Um, so we have a study group, there are four, five, ten members maximum, and all of us meet occasionally to take a passage of scripture and we read. And it's important that therefore we divide, you know, let's say the book we are reading into short, short, short passages. Okay, so we take Mark chapter 1, verse 1 to 10, then we take from verse um, 20 to, uh, 20 to um, 10 to 20, and, and so on and so forth. So, we divide it into short, short, short passages and we continue to read. So these are some of the ways that we could actually start studying the scripture. Thank you so much. And what are um, the benefits for us? As I stated the Bible, what are uh, some of the benefits one can stand to gain? All right. So you remember that we um, said earlier um, the maxim of St. Jerome, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So um, engaging with the word of God means that we are getting to know Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus himself said, again, I mentioned, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So first and foremost, uh, what we are benefiting from is a closer relationship with God who is revealing himself in the word. So by uh, engaging the scripture we're getting to know who god is but that is not the only thing in engaging the scripture we also get to understand or we get also get to be closer with our neighbor because what is the scripture about it's about love of god and love of neighbor 
So um, the scripture is going to help you to relate better with your neighbor. And everything that we're reading in the Bible about the Good Samaritan, you know, uh, is teaching us how to relate with our neighbor. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, what it talks about being a brother, you know, uh, forgiveness, all those things. So it's going to really strengthen the, the bond that you have with your neighbor. So the relationship with, between you and your God is going to be there. The relationship between you and your neighbor is going to be strengthened. Then also, remember that when we talk about um, strengthening the bond between us and our neighbors, uh, remember that our first neighbors are, are the church. So this is going to actually strengthen our understanding of the church because everything that the church does arises from the scripture. So you're going to be reading the Bible, you're not only understanding, you know, and building your relationship with your neighbor, but you're also building your relationship with the body of Christ. Um, and so you're understanding, you're understanding why you should therefore go to Mass every Sunday because you're reading from the Ten Commandments, it says keep the Sabbath holy. You're understanding why you're going to, what communion you're receiving means because Jesus took that bread and he gave it to his disciples. You're understanding what it means, who the Holy Spirit is. You're, you're understanding, you know, the church, okay? You're understanding the church. Um, then also, remember that the, the Bible is actually going to give you even a greater consciousness of the world and the creation around you. Now, today, we're living in, in a world that really doesn't respect you know, our creation. But read the Bible closely and see that right from the book of Genesis, um, the Bible gives us an understanding of how Adam was planted in the midst of the garden. It gives us a consciousness of our environment, you know. So look at, look at what is happening. You're building a relationship with your God. You're building a relationship with your neighbor. Your neighbor, not just your, any neighbor, but also you're finding yourself in the church. And it's also going to strengthen your relationship with the whole of creation around you. So the Bible gives you, uh, it makes you understand who you are in greater totality. Finally, the Bible is going to help you to understand who you are yourself. You made in the image and the likeness of God. It makes you understand how God created you, his purpose for your life, what he wants of you, and so on and so forth. And it brings you the peace that you need to grow as a person. So um, in all these things, uh, the Bible is going to help you, is going to make you a more rounded person, a more mature, a more developed person. And that is why I recommend the reading and the study of the Bible for everyone. Thank you so much, Father Michael. Um, we are about running our interview. Today we are talking about how to study the Bible. We've gone through a lot and he has mentioned a lot. Um, Father, in reading the Bible or in studying the Bible, definitely there may um, come some, some challenges may arise from wanting to read the Bible, wanting to uh, study the Bible. Um, can you just um, give us about some, two of um, the challenges we should expect and how we should um, deal with it once uh, we see those challenges? Well, um, we always have to understand, uh, first and foremost, like I said, that the Bible um, is divinely inspired. This is uh, the word of God. And Augustus, Augustus, you agree with me that no human being can understand God completely and totally. So this is one of the big things. No matter how much we study the Bible, we can never completely comprehend the mind of God. So it is a challenge, but it's a hard challenge. It's a challenge that um, causes us, therefore, not to give up because we strive to understand, you know, the word of God. So everybody who's going to read the Bible is going to come at a point where there is something that you really don't understand. But sometimes there is help, and that is why you want to share with other people, to ask other people, you want to continue to read, and gradually you get into um, to understanding it. Secondly, the second reason is clearly uh, the Bible was also written by human beings. And therefore, uh, it's difficult sometimes to understand the metaphors they are using, the language that they are using. In fact, if you really, really wanted to study the word of God, it meant that you have to go and study the Hebrew and the Greek. Oh, I can tell you that is not an easy thing to do. And so you definitely are going to get into 
some difficulties, things that you don't understand. And that is why you need to rely sometimes on the tools that I mentioned to be able to get into that. But let me add one, um, one more thing. Like I said, sometimes the problem is that we're really, really trying to understand, and understand what he's talking about. Other times we want to understand the human author and we don't understand. But I guess the greatest ob obstacle to reading the Bible is myself. Because even as you read the Bible, sometimes you're struggling, sometimes you're feeling sleepy, sometimes you're feeling bored, sometimes you, know, you don't feel like, sometimes you get lazy, you know, and so on and so forth. So maybe the greatest of the obstacles to reading the Bible is my own self. How to get myself seated, how to get myself disciplined, and how to keep doing this continually is perhaps the greatest challenge that anyone will face. But anybody who understands that this is about the word of God, this is about God revealing himself to me, will want to go the extra mile, want to do the extra sacrifice of finding that time, finding that place to be able to sit down quietly and to study. And I want to encourage everybody. There is so much to gain from it. Thank you so much, um, Father Michael, for that um, wonderful explanation on how to study the Bible. The program is a conversation, and today we've been talking about how to study the Bible. And Father has made it so simple for us, and I've been taking some notes, personal notes for myself to make sure that I now know how to study my Bible, not just by reading, read it aloud, and also in silence. You may see the difference between the two, and also make sure that you pray, you meditate, and then you contemplate. These are the tools we need. And the greatest challenge in studying the Bible is ourselves, me, not someone. And today we'll be talking about how to study the Bible. And thank you so much, Reverend Father, Dr. Michael Mason, for making this uh, topic so simple for us. And I hope our viewers and our listeners would actually uh, practice it from today onwards so that as Christians, our manual is the Bible, which is the word, as Father said. It's a word, yeah. and it's um, a combination of books. They were written by men. And we should bear in mind that when you're reading, you have to look at the context in which those, uh, the language, the person who wrote, and the, the comparison I love so much is when you pick someone like, someone from the Old Testament to another person, in, um, a writer in the New Testament, they are two different people, writing within two different settings different um, different um, era so these are some of the things we should bear in mind when we are reading the Bible. when we are studying the bible so that we can i really appreciate it so studying the bible may look like it's a very serious job yes it is but it's also very simple because that's what we need as christians to move on in life thank you so much father for this wonderful um, education and teachings and my name is augustus Hickins. adios Sometimes statement may not be clear, but there is always a deeper understanding. It is not just about the who said what. The whens, hows, and wheres are equally important. Join me on a whole new journey in the conversation with Augustus as I bring you discussions from religion to politics. Health to economy. humanity to social activities among many others. Conversation with Augustus knows no foreign borders. The show comes to you every Wednesday at 6.15 p.m. GMT on our YouTube channel Conversation with Augustus and on Radio Angelus www.radioangelus.com This program was sponsored by Safe Life Experience Consort Limited. Contact them for all your travel and tour needs as well as your events. Music